All right, now I have the thumbs up, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, number 71. And after this, our brother Jerry will lead us in a prayer. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. you Father, we come before you this evening thanking you for this opportunity we have to take pause from our work week and from our concerns, and we can spend time with each other and spend time with you. Father, as you well know that life is full with struggles and difficulties, and uh, your people are certainly not immune from experiencing them. Father, we pray for those of our number who are grieving for lost ones who have passed on or who are supporting people who have lost loved ones. Father, we pray for those who are combating illness because, it, Father, we understand that it can be so depressing being ill and uh, just not feeling right. So we ask that you would extend your healing hand to those who may have need. Father, we pray for your church that we would devote ourselves to fulfilling those things that you have commanded that we do, that we may live lives consistent with our professed faith of being Christian, of being faithful to you, so that others may perchance see our lives and ask for the reason of the hope that lies within us. And Father, we pray for your forgiveness, for we are weak. We often fail to do those things we ought to. And sometimes to our shame, we do those things we ought not to be doing. But we are so grateful that you have made provision for us that if we confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive us of our sins. And the blood of your Son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, be with us through the furtherance of this service. We pray that, uh, that it is pleasing and acceptable to you, and that as a result we may be just a little bit closer to you when we leave this building than when we came in. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. 
song is Holy Words, uh, which is unfortunately not in the book. So just follow along. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart words of life, words of hope. Give us strength, help us cope in this world wherever we roam. Ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words impart holy words of our faith handed down to this age, came to us through sacrifice, oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. In <clears throat> preserve for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words in Heart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts. Oh, let the ancient words in heart. We have come ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come with open hearts, Oh, let the ancient words impart. Our brother Gary will bring us a brief message. I want to welcome all of you here tonight. And I want to extend a hearty welcome to those of our brothers and sisters who are watching via YouTube. Jesus said, Behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. John chapter 1, verse 47. This statement was a compliment to Nathanael from Jesus himself, and therefore a divine approval of a virtue. And this virtue should be sought diligently because of the recommendation of Jesus. We should all be without guile. Let us note the negative and not the positive nature of the compliment for Nathaniel was without guile. What is guile? The word is translated from the Koine Greek, dolos, which Strong's Concordance defines as to catch with bait, as a decoy, a trick, a wile, a craft. It is also translated deceit, deceit to be guileful, and is linked with the word strife and intrigue. Here are some New Testament passages which point up the avoidance that the apostles recommended regarding the quality in their own lives and in the lives of others. 
In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guile. He had no other motive than what was apparent and what was spoken. Peter says that we should lay aside qualities that are common in the fleshly nature, and one of them is guile. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile, and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. He reminds us that this quality was never in Jesus' mouth. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Because guile is usually used in communication with others. Therefore, Peter says of the Christian, for he that will love life and see good days, let his tongue refrain from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. And regarding the followers of the Lamb of God, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they were without fault before the throne of God. Revelations 14 and verse 5. Here are some Old Testament passages that give us a similar admonition of the avoidance of guile. And as Jesus did, so does the Old Testament use negatives. The man who ascends in the hill of the Lord does not use guile. Psalms 24, verses 3 and 4. And blessed is the man in whom in his spirit there is no guile. Psalms 32 and verse 2. The worldly or self-motivated person might mistake this innocence as weakness or the quality of being naive, but God sees it as a blessing. Thus, the command to those who are more sophisticated, if they want to see good, is to keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Psalms 34 and verse 13. Here are some passages that define the meaning of guile or place it in association in such a way as to expose its qualities and characters to view. Psalms chapter 38 and verse 12 warns a person given to fantasies is particularly prone to this sin and speaks mischievous things and imagines deceits all the day long. It is easy for him, therefore, to lay snares, decoys to the hurt of others. It is easy for him to speak mischievous things to the hurt of others for personal gain. The quality of personal gain is brought to light in Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 5 and following, where we are warned to be cautious of the type of counselors that we choose. For the counsels of the person with guile are not given with our benefit in mind. Rather, They are mingled with deceits, according to this scripture, with the future benefit of the consular in mind. Remember that the thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. Proverbs 12 and verse 5. In this way, guile is sometimes called tact. In fact, some way cover his guile by an appeal to his tactfulness. But these are two different matters. A tactful counselor always seeks the other person's comfort and benefit. While guile is self-directed and is motivated by self-reward and by taking advantage 
of the person being consulted. Through such hypocritical misdirections, the term tack has come into a bad reputation as it is often a mere euphemism for guile. Guile is therefore a heart sin and is difficult to eradicate because it can be masked, because self-centered people are often self-deceived, and because people can be victimized. They can be fooled, therefore guile persists. With the increase of guile comes the increase of confusion, according to James chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. James says that guile produces envy, is a work of the flesh which produces confusion. Confusion is a result of guile and not of envy, probably because the source of contention is unrecognized, and as one deceit follows another, the person who builds his empire, however, it is fragile. Jeremiah calls the resulting confusion in the house of deceit a house, a cage full of birds. Jeremiah 5, 26 and 27. For my people are found wicked men. They lay wait as he that setteth a trap. They catch men as a cage full of bird. So their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and waxen rich. So is the one who lays his decoys. No wonder Psalms 43.1 asks God in prayer, O oh, deliver me from the man of guile, deceit. Proverbs 26.24 says that as guile increases, so does the hatred in the one who possesses it or is possessed by it. But no matter, he will be ultimately exposed. Though his hatred cover itself with guile, his wickedness shall be openly showed before the assembly. Proverbs 26 and verse 26. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 3 uh, 13, rather, says that guile is the possession of false prophets. Well, Ephesians 14, uh, verses, uh, chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, warns of the cunning ability and craft of those who contrasted with the candidness of Christians who speak the truth in love. Galatians 5.20 uses intrigue as a derivative idea of guile and associates it with sedition in the King James Version. This is not uncommon as an old song by the Temptations titled Smiling Faces Tell Lies had a line in it, they are telling with their face while all the while they are trying to take your place. Thus, even the sinners of the world understands the relationship between guile and sedition. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3 warns the person of guile that the quest for and the acquisition of vain glory is only for a moment. Since the person of guile is often jealous and full of envy, according to this packet, passage, the scripture is gives the remedy which is so simple. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Christians are not to use guile. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 3 through 6 should be noted, for our exhortation is not of error, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guile. But even as we have been approved of God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who proveth our hearts. 
For neither at any time were we found to use words of flattery, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor seeking the glory of men, neither from you nor from others, when we might have claimed authority as the apostles of Christ. Paul says that there was a never a time when he used guile or flattering words as a cloak. He said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2 that he did not handle the word of God deceitfully. He also said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 12 that candidness and openness, simplicity with a clear conscience, and that rejection of worldly wisdom are qualities worth rejoicing over. To emphasize this, he said, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to the one not listening. Christians do not use deceit, beat around the bush, or hide their real beliefs. Christians do not use guile. How can one use the word of God deceitfully? In Genesis chapter 34, Dinah's brothers, Jacob's sons, got a village of men to obey a command of God through deceit. Their apparent motive was to take advantage of them and to satisfy their desire for revenge. Apparently, they set out with this in mind to justify their action to their father later when they said, should our sister be treated as a harlot? Genesis 34 and verse 12. Jacob used guile as recorded in Genesis 30, 27 and verse 30, 35, where Isaac said, thy brother came with guile and had taken away thy blessing. He used guile to obtain the blessing. It is possible to look for good with a wrong motive and a wrong device. If we later direct our lives to live honestly, we will still have to pay the consequences of our sin. Jacob should have waited for God's time. Forever after, he would be viewed by Esau and his descendants, even to this day, as having stolen the blessing. Do not use guile for a good end. You will mingle the corruption of deceit with a blessing. Some preach Christ with guile. Their real motives may be vainglory, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, or envy or strife bred of self-interest. According to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul says some use pretense, intrigue, for a motive of preaching Christ. Their actual motive was to stir up strife and confusion. But Paul says, in any case, I am glad that Christ was preached. We should therefore not put down the good results of the hypocrite, but neither should we express praise on his behavior. Conclusion. Guile is to be avoided. Its complete absence is a blessing. Being simple and guileless is to be sought after. The presence of guile is destructive to the one exercising it, and the resulting confusion is a hindrance to the plan of God. Let us seek, each one of us, the day when Jesus will say, Behold a Christian in whom there is no guile. If there is anyone who has heard the message this evening and wants to request the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward or to please let us know. If there is anyone who wishes to obey the gospel, please let us know. If you are here, please come forward. If you are not, please contact us.
we ask all who have a need to come forward as we stand and sing the hymn of encouragement and invitation. Four sixty seven. The your anchor hold in the storms of life and the clouds unfold their wings of strife. When the strong tides lift and the cables strain, the your anchor drift or firm remain. announcements before we start our Bible classes. Um, most of these can be found in the mail outs that you get, so please be sure to take a look at those. Some of them will be updated and you'll get them tomorrow or Friday. <clears throat> so um, we've already talked about uh, Tracy. Uh, she has a broken foot. She'll not, she's not going to have surgery and she's planning to turn to work on Monday, right? Um, Justin needs prayers for healing and pain for his, for he just had surgery and had a kidney removed. Um, do, uh, information we received from Bedford Hills Nursing Center and, and Peggy Malo's family, the service for her daughter has been postponed until Saturday. What? Yeah. That's what I said. I was going to say Saturday, October 16th at 11 a.m. Um, so they're asking for prayers that, uh, that, that Peggy can re calm down. She's found out today their daughter's memorial will be delayed, so that was upsetting to her. Barbara Lovering's memorial has been moved to Saturday, October 23rd at 11 a.m. So a note here about Kate, Katie Paul uh, is closing on the house on Friday. She requests prayers. It all goes well, and no issues pop up. Uh, September 26th, there's a going away potluck for John Akabar. It's after Bible class. And uh, it says, bring your favorite dish to share. Octo October, can everybody hear me okay? October 1st, Friday night, if for the fathers at 6 p.m. Come join in for a pizza, fellowship, and work. 
And then October the 2nd is a work day. Time to get ready for this winter. If you have outdoor tools, rakes, and all kinds of hedge clippers and power washers, things like that, please bring them. We want to get the outside cleaned up before winter hits. And then next Sunday is going to be a song service. Uh, song leaders, please uh, come and uh, be ready. Oh, next Wednesday. What did I say? Uh, I'm trying to rush too much. Uh, next Wednesday is uh, song service. Song leaders, please come prepared and help uh, lead some songs for us. So I guess, uh, Steve, you got a verse or something for us to, to uh, sing while the teachers are preparing for the class. And if you're online, we hope you'll stay with us as uh, Danny leads a, a Bible class for us next. Number 66. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son. Good evening. Lord, I pray that your spirit will guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Nehemiah, chapter 2. We had uh, stopped at verse uh, 10, if I remember correctly. And uh, that was the verse where it says, When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. Now, just to remind us of where we've gone so far, who is that someone that had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel? Hard question. Nehemiah, the man for which the book is named. What has happened so far as this story has, has played out? Let's get a little little review here. What what has happened so far? Just give me one thing. Let's get the ball rolling. So the discovery of the walls were torn down and the city was in trouble, the people were subjugated. Okay. And what else happened? What what did Nehemiah accomplish so far? Matthew. He had backing from the king and supplies and money and favor to get this done. He had, yeah, okay. And that happened, why? What have we, what have we discovered so far as to how, who, to, to what did Nehemiah attribute this pretty great success? I haven't gone to the president and got money and supplies to rebuild the walls of Manchester. <laughs> right? I've not been able to accomplish that. So, God's Wes, favor. God's, favor. God's favor, that's what he attributed to, to God's favor. So God had taken this man, positioned him, what was his job? Cupbearer Cup to the emperor. So God had established him in a high place, in a place of influence. Do you pray for God to increase your influence? Do you pray for God to influence, to, to increase our influence for the kingdom that God might use us to change this city, to change this county, to change this state, to change this nation. I mean that's 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 what he asked for and God and God did it. Okay? So he's arrived in he's arrived in Judea and he has what? You said it supplies. What else does he have? Huh? The people. Some people, some people protecting him, right? Some people were sent to protect him. What else does he have? A letter. Letters from the king. The king. From the king. 
Letters from the king. God turned the heart of the king, as the scripture says, God turned the heart of the king to give favor to God's, to God's people. Okay? So that's where we are now. What did we just read about Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite? They're not happy. They're not happy. They're not happy about it. Okay? So... So far, this has been a story of incredible favor. And now what's going to happen? There's going to be, right? Acts, you, you're reading the book of Acts, chapters one through five. It's just, well, okay. Ananias and Sapphira, that's not exactly a happy story. <laughs> but, but the gospel's going forward and forward and advancing and advancing and advancing. And then you get to Acts chapter six and what's happening there. Struggle comes. Because of the great growth of the church, there is conflict that's coming among the people and some of the widows are not being taken care of and they have to solve the problem. So here we have, so here we have trouble coming, okay? Now, let's continue to chapter 11, uh, verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there for three days. Then I arose in the night, and I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon gate and to the dung gate and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went under the fountain gate to the king's pool but there was no, no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall and turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned and the officials did not know where had I had gone or what I was doing. And I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were, do, who were to do the work. So what happened here? He's doing an inspection. He's casing the joint. Yeah, he's doing an inspection, checking out the condition of the walls, what is going on. Who has he told about his mission so far? Nobody. Nobody. Is there a time to speak? Is there a time to keep your mouth shut? Okay, and that's not guile, is it? That's just knowing when to speak and knowing when, when not to speak. There are, in my lifetime, just speaking for me, I have very few words that I have not spoken that I have regretted. Does that make sense what I just said? Mm -hmm. There have been very few times that I've been silent that I've regretted it. For every time I've been silent and regretted it, there have probably been a hundred times that I have regretted speaking. Sometimes being careful. So he's being careful here. He's, it's, it's not time to, it's not time to, to speak. But, but then, do you see anything else? Do you see anything else in here? That, that's what I see in this passage. Maybe there's something else though that I missed. Yes, Kathy. Well, I'm going to say, he did say something to a few. I said that during the night with a few others. The ones that's true. He, the ones he specifically says he didn't say anything to are those in leadership roles in the Jewish community. Right. The ones he's going to have to make his pitch to. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, you're right. There were, there were kind of a few, that, I mean, there had to be some that knew about it because they came with him. Mm -hmm. Okay. But, but, the, but again, he was not over, not oversharing. That, that's, that's a great term now, nowadays. He's a real oversharer. Uh, that, that, I know people that can be accused of that. I think I might have been accused of that at the time or other. Then, verse 17. Anything else in that before we move on? I told you what I see. Kathy's told you what she sees. Anybody else see anything maybe that, that's been missed? Okay, verse 17. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates. Okay, so he's making the pitch now, isn't he? With the, with the gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. 
And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. What do you see in his, I called it a pitch. What do you see in his presentation to the people that is worth paying attention to? Yes. The greatest significance is in God's power in all things, not in ours, nor our perception of by our power. Okay, God's power. Where did where do you see him referring to God's power? Peter said the greatest significance is in God's power. Where do you see him referring to God's power? And I told them of the hand of my God. Say that loud. And I told them of the hand of my God which had been good upon me. So yeah, how had God's hand been good upon him? He, he told them how the hand of God had, been, had been, been good upon him. How had God's hand been good upon them? We just talked about that, didn't we? He answered the prayers. He, John, what were you going to say? God granted him favor. He granted him favor or grace. He granted him favor. Yeah, we saw, we, we just reflected on all the many ways that God had granted him favor. He got there with supplies. He got there with protection. He got there with letters. The king just gave him everything. So uh, in Revelation, it says they overcame by the blood of the lamb and by the what? By the word of their testimony. What has God done for you lately? What about his story in you, in your life? How can you think of a time recently where applying a biblical principle, you did it, Maybe you didn't want to obey it, but you obeyed it. How did it work out? You see how you see how our life and how God's work in our life as we obey him, sometimes maybe when we don't want to, but we go ahead and trust him anyway. Do you see how that can be an encouragement to another person? Think about that. I speak to my children often about what they ought to do. But guess what persuades them? Somebody else who speaks to them about what they ought to do. <laughs> it drives me crazy. I'm your old man. I've got all this wisdom. I've got all this experience. Yeah, dad, whatever. Somebody else will say the same thing. That's the way it's supposed to work. I have to accept that. Right. Yes, Peter. Again, it's by your actions, not by your words. Right. And God's and, and, and by his revealing God's actions, right? When Moses came and said, Hey, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna leave, he talked to them and showed them and revealed to them and showed them what God was able to do, and they were persuaded by that. Okay? The word of the lamb, the blood of the lamb, and the word of your testimony. What is he doing in your life? Right? Your story can actually help other people. If, if that story is one where you're walking in the word and able to tell somebody how that worked well for you. Yes? Uh, he also pointed out the dire consequences that they were in, that it was desolate. We're in trouble, y'all. Come on. Let's face, let's face facts. You know, without telling them that he went around and surveyed, but he gave them the... the, the uh, yeah. Thing saying the walls are down, the gates are all burned up. There's there's no protection for us. And see what's interesting, they were living there. He wasn't telling them anything that they probably already knew. they probably already knew, certainly should have known, but were probably just not wanting to face it. Somebody came and said, "Let's fix this problem." Yes, Matthew. I wanted to add in because not only does it say the hand of my God has been upon me, but it mentions the words that the king spoke. Right. And, and that's important because this is not them coming back from Babylon. They have been here a while. This is the last type of group that came back and they could have rebuilt according to the word of God. They should have been doing that all of this time. But and you weren't. know from the earlier in this chapter in verse 10 and even what we're going to read next that they knew there were people against them. 
And now they have not only the hand of their God, which hadn't really mattered too much in their history. Right. And, you know, they showed what that was like when God was with them, and they were always looking for extra earthly help of some kind. Mm -hmm. But now you have the words of the king, which will provide some protection, some legal ability to do this without any type of oppression, and they're ready to go because of that. God's hand is on us, and by the way, the king said it's okay to Jerry. But also, it's important to remember that it was God's disfavor that resulted in Jerusalem being destroyed in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so I can understand the reticence on their part to start rebuilding. Yeah. But with Nehemiah, when, it, when he made mention that God looked with favor upon him, that God is on board with his undertaking, that that, that kind of communicated that God's disfavor was no longer operative, that God's favor had returned. Yeah. He's ready for, God is ready for us to rebuild. Correct. God is ready for us to rebuild. Yeah. Okay, very, really good thoughts, every one of you. Anything else that, that might have been overlooked? Okay, let's keep going. Um, where did I stop? So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Is that where I stopped? Verse 18. Now, but when Sanballat, Balat the Horonite, and Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arab, and by the way, the, we were talking about a Samaritan, you're talking about an Ammonite, and you're talking about an Arab, historic enemies of historic enemies of, of the people of Israel. Who remembers where the Ammonites came from? Huh? Well, they came from Ammon, yes, but where did they <laughs> What's the origin of the Ammonites? Remember the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah? I think we might have reflected on this a couple of weeks ago, right? They had a really sick beginning, the nation of the Ammonites. That was, Ben Ammi was one of the sons of Lot that was conceived when his daughter got him drunk and, and seduced him in his sleep and, and she, she became pregnant, okay? That's where the Ammonites began. The Samaritans, what's the issue with the Samaritans, y'all? Who wants to tell me what? Yeah. Kind of half breeds, yeah. Yeah, Wes, you had to do your three. Uh, yeah, there were the there were a mix uh, of the Jews that were left behind, plus uh, locals who came in, plus people who were put in to the country by uh, Babylon when they kind of took over. So they're kind of a mishmash of different yeah. cultures that have no solid lineage. And they were not only half breeds. By biologically, but more importantly, how, what did that? What effect did that have on their true on true religion? Yeah, yeah. Um, good. They were corrupt in that way as well. So again, right. how the how did the Jews feel about the Samaritans in Jesus' day? I mean, come on, y'all remember? Yeah. yeah, they were the worst of the worst, right? And then of course the Arabs have gotten along with the Jews for a long time, haven't they? Yeah. So we got <laughs> these three, right? We got these these three elements that are not friends of the Jews, okay? What about us? Are we facing any opposition in our day as we seek to rebuild what has been torn down? Has anything been torn down in our country? Has the Christianized America, in, in, in 1891, the Supreme Court declared after an exhaustive search of all of our foundational documents that the United States is a Christian nation, 1891. Mm -hmm. 130 years later, what's been torn down? So is there gonna be opposition as we rebuild? And by the way, do I wanna rebuild what was in existence in, in, in 1891? I wanna go forward where God wants us to go. We don't, we don't need to just rebuild that. We need to rebuild. We need to be, be God's kingdom, right? On this earth. Matthew? Yeah, it brings to mind 2 Timothy chapter 3, or three 2, 13. 
So you have all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You have Jesus saying that if you do what I have done, they hated me, they're going to hate you even more. Right. And even throughout the history of the Bible, you look at the Old Testament prophets, the one who are actually trying to do God's will, and they were often murdered because there's always opposition to people doing the will of God. And what's really interesting to me about this is in verse 10, you have two people named, and here in this verse, now you're up to three. And there's going to be more as this goes along, because they're going to gather their side of things mm -hmm. to try to stop the work of God. And right. we're always going to be in a minority of some kind when trying to do that. But with God's hand on our side, we can overcome anything. And this is a book of victory. We've seen the victory. We're going to continue to see the victory, but it doesn't. It, it, it happens around opposition. Okay. I hope you realize I'm a happy guy. I am. I, I seek the joy of the Lord. I want to live the joy of the Lord. I want us to live the joy of the Lord. I want us to have his victory. Part of having real joy is understanding that, yeah, there are enemies. They're there. But God has overcome. You know the end of the story is all going to get built. And it's going to get built in record time. Okay, well, I don't know what that means for us, but I know we have a job to do to rebuild what has been broken down. You know, if you've got something broken down in your life that needs to be rebuilt, time to, you know, let's work on that. If we've got things in this church that are broken down that need to be rebuilt, let's figure out what they were. Let's do that survey that Nehemiah did, you know, riding around the walls and figure that out and then let's, let's get about the business of, of repairing it and if we see something in this community that needs to be rebuilt restored and we through the gospel can have some impact on it let's get after it now, the gospel is the answer I was, I was talking with somebody earlier tonight about it. You know, wickedness just plays out in all sorts of perverse ways. And what is the solution? Jesus Christ and him crucified. If we could learn to obey his commands, so much insanity that people are participating in nowadays, they, they, would, they, would, they would put it aside. So the solution is, is simple. But all the reasons we don't want to, all the reasons we don't want to, uh, apply the solution, you know, we can make those kind of complex because we're smart people. Let's get about business rebuilding. That's what he did. And he did it despite the opposition. Now it says here, when Sambal of the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite and Gish of the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, what is this thing that you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? <sighs> Do we hear that kind of language in our day sometimes? Yes. Are our, is the path that we walk on sometimes jeered at? I don't know that, okay, maybe some of us have, have experienced it directly. I suspect most of us have seen other people brought out to ridicule more than we've actually experienced it ourselves. I don't know though, okay? But this is what happened there. They were jeered at and despised us and said, what is this thing you were doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, the God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build, but you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. The God of heaven will make us prosper and we his servants will arise and build. What does that say to you? But we're considering a broken world. It isn't gonna fix itself, it takes us to be able to- We will rise and build. God will make us prosper. 
give me that hammer, man. I'm ready to roll. I'm not really good with a hammer. You should probably give me some room. <laughs> but I'll swing it. <laughs> yeah. Um, we also have to remember, though, that we have to be willing to do the work. We're not willing to do the work. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's saying we will rise and build. We! We've got to be willing to arise and build. Okay. Who's going who's gonna to build it? We. Okay. Now, there's another passage, if the, except the Lord build the house, right? They labor in vain to build it, okay? Right. Who's really building the wall? God is. But guess what? He, he puts the hammer in our hand. He puts the drill in our hand. He puts the tools in our hands. Yes? He gives us the talent. He gives us, yeah, he gives us the skills and the abilities to, to do it. We're in the body with many, many gifts and many abilities and... And the cool thing in the Old Testament, you see people that were given actual working man, hand skills, right? So, so God gave those skills to them. Um, you talk about a uh, vision statement. Churches are right, what's the vision statement? Vision statement, vision statement. That wouldn't be a bad one, would it? The God of heaven will make us prosper and we, his servants, will arise and build. I just like the sound of that. Is that your goal? Is that, why, is that your approach to life? Why? I, let me, I, I, I'll tell you why that encourages me as much as it does, but I want to hear from you. Why does that encourage you so much? We've talked about our responsibilities, but there's something else in here that really, really encourages me. I ask you to read my mind. Just read the passage again. What's it say? What's God going to do? Give us success. Give us success. The God of heaven will make us prosper. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every, every creature. I said, preach the gospel to every preacher. I almost said, that probably wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, right? Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's our calling. That's his command. If he's commanding us to do it, don't you think he knows how to prosper us in it? Right? Pick up your hammer, y'all. We can do this. Yeah. Uh, one thing it teaches me. You get the final word, by the way, because it's after eight. One thing it teaches me is to stop listening to people who are outside of a relationship with God. Because they try to plant doubt that following God is the right thing to do. These guys said, are you really going to rebel against the king? And, you know, Nehemiah's like, well, we have letters from the king saying that this is okay, but that might sway some people to go, well, maybe this isn't the right idea. And it makes me think of Isaiah 36, where the Rav Shaka is talking to Hezekiah, and he's saying, don't let Hezekiah make you trust in your God, because we're going to come and take you over anyway. And everything we see in Scripture shows when we trust God and when we do what he says, it always works out. But when we give in to the doubt and the people who say maybe God's way isn't best, we get off track and bad things happen. Yeah, we get all creative and you know, Lord, Lord, help me to obey the simple truths, the simple hard truths so that I can walk in your prosperity and help us to learn to do that as well. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. And when I say his prosperity, I ain't talking about money, 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 money. I'm talking about God's provision. I want God's provision, God's protection. That, that's how we're going to win the battle. Any final words from anybody? Please, Danny, quit talking. Okay. Thank you all for your participation tonight. So we'll go to chapter three uh, next Wednesday.